Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode six of the Beyond Football Show. Uh, I'm delighted to announce my special guest today. I'm joined by uh, Republic of Ireland and Crystal Palace goalkeeping coach Dean Kiley. How are you, mate? Yeah, all good. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, all good. Thank you. Yourself? Yeah, good, good. Really good. Thanks again for your time uh, coming on the podcast this evening. We really appreciate it. No, pleasure. Yeah. Brilliant. So to kick things off, I guess I want to take you uh, right back to the start of um, your career. Um, kind of like before you got into football. And I'm really interested to find out um, what was the initial thing that got you into uh, wanting to be a footballer and, um, and a goalkeeper specifically as well? So um, what it is really is I was born in Manchester, but I was brought up in um, Warwick. And the background to that is uh, my, dad's, uh, my dad's Irish. He came over as an immigrant um, a million years ago, uh, met an English woman and that was them. And then Along came me and my dad never played football, uh, had no real interest in football, but um, the Irish community in, in Warwick and Leamington and Coventry around the Midlands, um, there was some sort of Irish clubs and whatever. And, and what they did is they formed started football teams. And then when I showed an interest when I was at school, sort of seven, eight, nine, that sort of age, um, my dad really got involved um, with socially this Irish club that he was involved with. But... The, the, the football side of it, really, and, and his friends run football teams and their siblings, uh, sons and whatever played. And that was me in. And then once I showed a, a sort of um, a, a shine into it and something I wanted to do, then um, that was it. My dad, my dad started Sunday teams and, and, and ran those Sunday teams. I played for my school and all that sort of thing. And that, that was really the start of it. And then I think the better, the better you become or... The more you love it, the more you want to do it. And, and that, was, that was me, really, from an early age, I think. Brilliant, brilliant. So, um, obviously, from your initial interest in the sport, was it, was it being a goalkeeper that was your first thing? Or did you just want to be involved in football, sort of, in general? No, I, just, I, I played football. I was an outfield. I uh, played sort of left-back, left-midfield. Um, and I was OK. I had a decent ability and did OK. Played, you know, played sort of district football and... and, and school football um it was probably my lack of fitness I would imagine which sound well I don't mind admitting it now because it's worked out okay but at the time and then it was one of those classic stories there was sort of lacking a goalkeeper or not many people willing to go in goal and you know I probably had a stitch at the time and thought you know what I'll I'll knock this running on the head or, you know I'll knock this running around on the head really and I went in goal um, and then got the bug and flying around, getting filthy, dirty and whatever and all them sort of things. And that was it then. So uh, sort of 12, 13, 14 was, um, was me being a goalkeeper. And then from there, I, I, you know, I sort of, that was what I wanted to do. Brilliant. So um, when did it uh, start to turn from obviously uh, an ambition, something you did, um, you know, as a kid, uh, you know, getting out there and playing to something when you realise, right, you know, I, I could actually end up being a professional footballer here. Yeah, I think, um, so I was a decent, I was a decent student in terms of in a, a sort of first year of secondary school, I was in all the top sets and everything for, for everything I did. Um, from playing Sunday football, I got picked up, uh, I went, uh, trialled at Birmingham City and then West Bromwich Albion. Um, and it was West Bromwich Albion, I trained as a schoolboy, I signed schoolboy forms and my dad would take me over two or three times a week from Warwick um, over there to train. Um, they were really positive on me, West Brom, uh, in that respect. And then what happened is, um, at that time, there was no academies as such, just apart from youth teams and schoolboy forms that you signed for clubs. But um, the FA had started a national school at Lillishaw, one of the sports centres uh, in okay. Shropshire. And... Um, the national school took 16, um, what they would deem as the best sort of schoolboys um, from all the clubs uh, and sort of take them and school them and, and coach them and, and train them. And all the clubs put forward three, four, five players. You went through trials, local trials, district trials, um, national trials. And I was fortunate, uh, I got all the way through and I was selected to go there um, from 14 to 16 as a as a sort of um, a scholar there sort of thing. So I lived, I moved away from home at 14. I went to live at this, the National Sports Centre at Lillishaw where the FA National School was uh, and had two years where um, it was amazing. It was fantastic um, for me. I played England schools, football a little bit and then amazing. this FA school 
this FA school stood separately um, uh, on its own and, and as an England team. Um, and it was a great experience. It sort of microwaved me because normally at 16, you go in as, as a club full time as a first year apprentice. But this was two years previous to that. And it sort of um, sort of hardened you to football and, and, and sort of amplified your progress probably two years earlier than it should have really. And um, it, it, it's good status, you know, you're sort of representing uh, England and all that sort of thing. So it was um, it was a great start for me, really. And like I say, but I mean, listen, I'll, I'll be up brutally honest. You know, we still went to school and we had exams and we had a couple of afternoons where we were off, but we were in mainstream school locally to the sports centre. My grades went from really good to really average because mm. I just wanted to play football. Um, so they suffered, but um, thankfully my football career probably didn't, you know, so it turned out OK, I suppose. Of course, amazing, amazing. So obviously from the um, from the schoolboys and the youth set up, I mean, I've got here um, that your first club you signed for was, was Coventry City. Um, how, how was that? How was that moment, obviously, doing something that you were doing sort of alongside school, obviously the progress you saw going through the schoolboys and through the ranks? How was that feeling? Do you remember that first day where you obviously you signed that pro contract and you thought, right, you know, the dream is this is the first step on the ladder, so to speak? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean... Um... At West Brom, Nobby Styles and um, and Johnny Giles were the managers, and uh, in terms of the first team, and they treated me and others, I think, fantastically well. You felt a connection. Um, then Ron Saunders was appointed manager at West Brom. Uh, there was a real disconnect um, between first team and the youth team and schoolboys and whatever. It didn't feel fantastic, and I sort of. Um, because I lived in Warwick and there was a couple of lads at the school, uh, the FA National School that were playing for Coventry, said like, well, you know, if it's, if it's not great at West Brom and this, that, and the other, you could maybe come to Coventry and this, that, and the other. So I went to a tribunal to get out of my schoolboy forms at West Brom and I signed for oh, Coventry. Wow, okay. So that was, I think, Neil McDonald um, was the first player to do that, young player as a tribunal. I think I was the second one in, um, in terms of tribunals to get out um, away. And I did, I did that um, and Coventry gave me the opportunity. So I finished my national school uh, the two years and I started my first year apprenticeship at Coventry in 1987. Obviously, they, they'd won the FA Cup just previous mm -hmm. to that in May. So it was a fantastic time to be at Coventry City. They're really on the up, you know, I say Premier League side. They're a first division side, which was later to become the Premier League. Um, and it was great. I, I was there. I signed... Um, a professional contract after three months. I was three, normally a two years an apprentice. I was three months an apprentice, but I think I, because I've been to the school, I signed oh. pro 17, uh, which my birthday was in October. So I signed pro forms and played in the youth team. Really successful. I think probably deemed as a, a bit of a bright prospect because I'd come from the school, uh, the national school. Um, and did it work out? I wanted it. You know, the dreams were to be to play for Coventry and uh, and stuff like that. It didn't work out that way. Um, Steve Grizovich was the first team goalkeeper, who was an amazing, amazing goalkeeper and an amazing man. You know, I learned loads, uh, loads off Steve Grizovich. I remember John Sillett saying to me one time, who was the manager, "Listen, keep going." To me, he pulled me in, keep going, son. You know, you know, Oggy can't go on forever, and you know, you sort of take your opportunity if it comes your way. And literally, I think 10 years later, he was still playing for Coventry in the Premier League. So, you know, it was an, Oggy was an immovable object, really, for me. Yeah, um, yeah. And for, for many others. So, you know, but then that starts your journey of professional football for me. And um, my, my, um, my outlook on it was really is that I will go wherever I need to go um, to play football and to make a contribution. So... That's that's really what I did. I embarked on that journey, really. Amazing, amazing. So did you find that obviously having those role models and people to look up to, obviously being a younger lad coming up through the ranks, did you find that that helped you a lot in the early stages of your career, would you say? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's like anything, not just in football. If you're in close proximity to people um, doing things very well and at the top of their profession, um, I remember as a, as a young child watching games on the television as a 10, 11, 12-year-old and going out in the back garden and try and mimic 
Peter Shilton, Ray Clements, Pat Jennings, yeah. try and mimic how they play in goal, how they make saves, how they kick the ball. And from trying to mimic people, you find your own way and you find the best way to do things for you. So um, for me to be in and around a first-team environment at Coventry, albeit on reflection now, a lot further away from playing in Coventry's first team than I probably thought I, I was. Um, it was great. And, and to learn off Steve Grizovic and his work, his work ethic was incredible in terms of, you know, staying out, doing extras, working on crossing, working on kicking, you know, never thinking he was finished. He was the finished article, always trying to be better when he was a real experienced goalkeeper. So that, that was something that I took with me, certainly along, along my way. Amazing, amazing. So obviously in your um, early career after Coventry, uh, you moved to uh, York and Bury and spent quite a lot of time there. Uh, how did you find that uh, experience and your time at those clubs to obviously shape your later career, obviously with Charlton and West Brom, which we'll get onto a bit later on in the podcast? Yeah, no, listen, um, my, my route has been one that was really sits really well with me and really comfortable in the fact that I um, played like 759 senior appearances for all those clubs and certainly the cutting my teeth at York City and Bury and getting promoted out of every division you know so, yeah. so being at Coventry finding that you hit a ceiling and you think well I can't get by Steve Grizzit now the easy option would have been for me to re-sign which I could have done uh, being a local lad lived down the road you know you're a Coventry player but you're not a first team player, you know, you, you need to, oh. it's very difficult as a young player, you know, a lot of my peers in the same sort of age groups that I were, re-signed, 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 and then at 22, 23, 24, you go, well, they've got a couple of League Cup appearances, but not too much else behind them, what are they going to do? And their career sort of fizzles out a little bit, so on reflection, for me to leave at, I think it was 20, and go to York, I initially went there on, on loan uh, and then signed in that close season and, and signed there permanently, was a massive risk because you're, I think York City finished fourth bottom of the old fourth division or, you know, what is League mm. Two now. So they were perilously close to the bottom of the, the whole football pyramid or the professional football pyramid. Yeah. But what, what, I, li what I liked about that was... Everything was in my hands in terms of if I was going to be successful and make a career playing football, I needed to get in York's team. I needed to, to get to oust the goalkeeper who was there. And at the time, the sell to me was, listen, the fellow who we've got does okay, but I'm not sure if he can you know, play for too much longer or whatever it be. You as a young goalkeeper you know, with attributes and potential can come and let's see you know, if you can get him out. And you know, thankfully, I... I got into the team and then played well over 200 games for York City, uh, was part of a promotion. Um, we got to the playoffs actually to get into the championship, which as we sit here now talking, sounds incredible. Like, yeah, um, it's an amazing achievement. You know, so for such a team in terms of, you know, the old Bootham Crescent ground, when I, when I, I think I made my debut, there might have been 1,800, 2,000 people there uh, tonight that, you know, you're playing and, and there's six, seven, eight thousand, which doesn't sound a lot, but, you know, in relative terms, that's a big deal. And York City were in the ascendancy a bit and doing doing really, really well. And for me to play in that team and, and make a contribution and make a positive contribution was good. And it, it benefited York and it also benefited me. It gave me a, a base and a platform to work off, you know, to... You know, because then I was a, a League One player for York City, playing every week, which was which was incredible. Of course, of course. Do, do you think your um, your ambition and your your direction throughout your career to always say, look, you know, I don't want to settle for being second or third choice goalkeeper. Always wanted to put yourself in a position where you would be the first choice. Do you think that type of mentality has got got you to you know the heights that you reached? Yeah, I, I think so. I think because um, certainly at Coventry City. It, it was before sub goalkeepers. It was before, you know, um, yeah. you know, lots of subs and one of them being a goalkeeper. So it was before that time. So I hope, I, I hope that if that rule was in, in force then and I was sat on the bench for Coventry, it wouldn't have made me soft and just settle for sat there, you know, being sat there. But 
that rule wasn't in. So you're either in or you are out. And I yeah. found myself out at Coventry. So to go somewhere to make a contribution, York was one of three or four options for me to go to. Um, I chose there. Keith Houchin, who was at Coventry, who scored one of the goals in the cup final, used to play at York City. And he said to me, I, I just asked him as a, an older player, um, I've got an opportunity to go to York. And he said, look, it's an amazing place. It's an amazing yeah. football club. It's only really small, but it might be, it might suit you sort of thing. And I took his advice and went and it was, it, it, it worked out fantastically well for me. Yeah, there's, there's no question. Brilliant. So it sounds like you've had some uh, amazing memories from, you know, your early days in your career. Uh, can you pinpoint like a match or a moment or a season in particular from your time at York or Bury that really sort of sticks out for you um, and so, something that you look back on fondly? Yeah, so I think obviously um, York got promoted into League One uh, through the playoffs and we beat Crew at Wembley uh, 0-0 after extra time, whatever, and I saved one of the penalties um, for York to get promoted. So, um, you know, I, I'm in no way, shape or form saying, oh, so that was great, you know, for me type thing. But what I mean is it was a culmination of, as a young player, getting into the team, sustaining, you, you know, because it's a tremendous effort uh, now that I'm a coach and I see it from the other side. It's a tremendous effort to get selected to play for a team. Yeah, of course. It's a, it's a huge effort to keep being selected, to then become the number one goalie, to then become the, and I don't mean the first name on the team sheet, but what I mean is is one of the, the staple go-to, yeah, well, Dean's playing because, you know, he's, he's our goalkeeper. He, he's done yeah. great. So that's the, and that's, that's what happened for me at York. And that's what got me into that rhythm of playing first team football, um, trying to win on Saturday, trying to get three points, trying to get a win bonus, you know, a couple of win bonuses in a month made a huge difference to, you know, me. I, I, met, my, I met my wife in York. Um, she used to cut my hair. She was, she was my barber. And so I met her in York. And what I mean is that so then you come together and that's your journey. And like I say, you know, if we can beat, if we can beat Lincoln or whatever on a Saturday and we can get a win bonus and this, that, and the other, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, so of course. Just trying to be just trying to win and be successful and trying to forge a career was was huge at York. And then, you know, obviously um Barry recruited me from York um into League One and, and Stan Turner was saying I'm putting the team together to get promoted out of this division. Um and I want you to be my goalkeeper. I rock up at Berry, you know, it's across the M62. Uh, I move over, you know, my, my, my wife moves over and, and, and children move over and off we go. Another next bit of the adventure. And we got we got promoted that first season. And again, all of a sudden, then I play all the games. We're really successful and we're in the championship. So for me, I'm looking in, I think it was 96, 97. I'm a, I'm a championship goalie. Whereas not too long ago, I was a League Two goalkeeper trying to, you know, sort of get in someone's team and, and play some games and show people what I can do. So um, to overcome, to get over those hurdles, I think at York nice. and Bury, and to find myself in that division one step away from the Premier League, albeit with a, what people would deem as a small club, was, uh, was huge. Yeah, definitely. Amazing, amazing. So obviously, when you were coming to the end of your time at, um, at Bury, uh, did you um, sort of, were thinking, so obviously... And think about when Charlton approached you. Uh, did you sort of have ambitions at the time to thinking that you wanted to make the next step up, or were you sort of thinking of continuing your time with Bury and the offer came in and you thought, right, I've got to take this opportunity under um, obviously Alan Kerbishley? I think I think the um, I think the progression that I'd made is that um, it's always a it's always a perception of you know the next level. You know, will it be a step too far? Will I be able to play in that level? And so hmm. I answered the question at League Two. Can I play league football? Can I make a career? Yeah, I've ticked that box. You know, you get promoted into League One. Strikers are better, a bit quicker, this and the other. Yeah, can do that. There's a tick. Get into the championship with Berry, small club. You know, I think the best thing for me that describes me is I'm a successful underdog. You know, I've never been at Man United or Arsenal or wherever. The clubs I've been at have always been deemed good, solid clubs, but them underdogs that are overachieving, can they do this, that and the other? So that suited me, you know, but 
when you're one step away from the Premier League, then all of a sudden you start thinking, well, it's not too far. It isn't too far away. Um, the, 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 for me, um, Berry got relegated in 99. Um, and I think I, kept, I think I kept something like 18 clean sheets in a relegation season. Uh, and then the following year, when I signed for Charlton, to get promoted into the Premier League, I kept 19. You know, so in the Championship at that level, I think what Charlton had identified is that a solid goalkeeper can play at that level and, and, and make a good contribution. So um, for me, it was, again, a nice steady progression for me. Berry were, were fantastic. I enjoyed three brilliant years. I, I really did, you know, made some good friends and um, the, football was, the football was great. Um, but Charlton, I think, really offered me that that vehicle into the potentially into the Premier League, and obviously nice. it worked out to be to be that you know. So um, it, it's obviously worked out to be a a good a good choice, really. Amazing. So obviously that that time at Charlton, um, I was I was looking back through over lockdown. I've gone through and uh, sorted some stuff out from the loft, and I found a, a book of uh, you remember the shootout cards. Yeah, yeah. That you could collect. And the old Charlton team and the sort of the memories I have of that at that time um, growing up and getting into football and my family, my parents kind of talking about it. Like, how was it being a part of that squad? Because obviously you got promoted and, you you know, you had some real success and really standout players. Obviously, Scott Parker, Paul Konchesky, a few names to kind of name a few. Like, how was it being a part of that dressing room at that time? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was great because, um, again... Um, unfashionable underdogs, whatever you want to call Charlton, you know, in terms of London football and clubs and whatever, you know, there's way, way more fashionable teams. Um, but what I quite liked, um, Charlton, obviously I signed there, you know, they dropped out of the Premier League. They'd had one season in there, they dropped out and then they were right, we, we need to go straight back in. Um, recruited me and a few others. And yeah, you're right, Scott Parker, um, Paul Koncheski, Chris Powell, Jason Yule, Jonathan Johansson, you know, Sean Bartlett, Mark Fish. These are these are proper players. These are, but yeah, also yeah. They're solid. They're solid fellows. They're great people to work with, you know. And um, it's probably only now, as a coach, that I should, re you know, you, you look back and you think uh, Alan Kerbsley deserves enormous credit um, for because at the time in that squad. We would all say between ourselves, God, Curbs has got it so easy because look at us, you know, we just go out, we get it done, we're low maintenance, you know, there's no, yeah. dumb, there's no egos. This, this, we're just a hard working bunch and this, that, and the other, which was correct. But now as a coach, I look and, well, someone's had to put that together. Someone's had a recruitment policy, you know, which is obviously Curbs, Mervyn Day, Keith Peacock, and Peter Varney, who was the chief executive. They have formulated a plan, a style, a type of player they want. And that was, that was it. And I think for Charlton to finish, God, listen, in the time I was there, never in a relegation battle, never in a must-win game, never in a last-day nail-biter to stay in the division. We were 9th, 14th, 12th, 11th, you know, in and around that mid-table zone. For somebody like Charlton is is quite incredible, and for me to to play in the main most weeks, um, uh, you know, I was sort of player of the year a couple of times, second, third, you know, so making a contribution, not being a passenger on that vehicle, actually helping oh. drive that vehicle is is huge. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So obviously, uh, you mentioned your um, of player of the year as well, and um, I also read that you've recently been. Uh, inducted into the Charlton Hall of Fame. Um, how was that? Because obviously, um, from what I understand from my research, what you, you had a really good relationship with the Charlton supporters. So how was that moment when you found you were going into the to the Hall of Fame? Yeah, listen, it's a, it was a big deal because um, in terms of my career, I look at my time at Charlton and all the, tris, the, the twists and turns and the trials and tribulations that's, that's happened to that club thereafter you know, now, even now to this, this time now, is that in the modern era, that was Charlton's golden era. Yeah. And it 100% hit 
hit the sweet spot of coinciding with Dean Kiley's golden era in terms of playing at the highest level, playing every week and, and, and being a Premier League footballer. So it, it, it's amazing to be in their Hall of Fame. Um, the timing was just so that I was at that club at their best time yeah. and I was at that club at my best time. Simple. I say simple, it's, you know, whatever it is, luck or fate or whatever it be, but um, incredible, you know, and just, you know, the time, you know, for my family to grow up, to be in and around that and, and, and my family to be involved and there every, you know, every other Saturday at the Valley or following us around. It was a, a great adventure for my family as well. But I mean, listen, there's a statue of Sam Bartram outside the Valley, who's a, a goalkeeper from many, many years ago. And, you know, People always say, listen, you were you were one of the best goalies at Charlton. And then they go, yeah, but, you know, Sam Bartram. And you see this big bronze statue of Sam Bartram. Yeah. So, you know, he's a, he's a legend. <laughs> but to be even mentioned in the same paragraph is, um, it, it is, is great for me, you know, no question. Maybe there'll be a Dean Carley one next to it one day. Well, I don't know. Maybe a, <laughs> maybe a plasticine one or something like that. <laughs> So, uh, so as you mentioned, uh, Alan Kerbishley, what was he like um, as a manager, uh, his relationships with the players? And obviously he talked about the players he brought in, obviously cultivated a certain atmosphere. But what was he like day to day on the training pitch and obviously before, before the games? Yeah, so he, um, so Kerbs was quite, um, you know, really good on the, on the pitch, um, putting a team together, shaping a team up, um, motivating a team. Um, Monday to Friday, actually um, wasn't around and, and on, the, on the shop floor and driving things. He was quite, you know, sort of detached from that. Um, but that was, that was his style, you know. And um, the, the thing for me is that you, you're, you're judged by, by your actions and your actions as a, as a manager is recruiting a team, putting a team together, moulding them, shaping them, putting them on the pitch and then being successful. And he did all those, he did all those things and did them really, really well over a long, a long period of time. Amazing. Did, did your group at the time, I and mean, obviously with his staff and the coaches that you worked with, did you, did you sort of realise that the, like the, the level of achievement and success if you, that you were having, if you see, or is it more as a reflective thing now, you look back and you think, wow, you know, that was, think, we were flying high. I think it's reflective because I think what you've got to look is you never see the future and the future for Charlton once Curbs left and once that team disbanded was it just spiralled down and down and down and down. So, you know, I remember Curbs stood with Francis Jeffers, Danny Murphy and uh, Dennis Romadal and, you know, we're going to the next level. And I think we finished 11th, for example, that season. And yeah. so the existing players would be a little bit like, well, where is the next level for Charlton? Because I think we're pretty much, we think we're pretty much there. We're yeah. doing, we're, we're, you know, eyes are popping out to, to maintain this. You know, mid-table finishes in the Premier League in that era are, are huge, you know? So wow. for Charlton to be beating Arsenal, to be beating Chelsea, to be beating Tottenham, you know, all those, them sort of results, they do become, if you keep doing them consistently over a long period of time, they do become the norm. But it's yeah. really hard to get away from that fact and go, hold on, guys, listen, there's something, this is, this is amazing. This is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, it becomes what people expect. But on the budget, on the, you know, you look at the team on paper, I love playing in that Charlton team. I love Mark Fish, Richard Rufus, Steve Brown, Chris Powell, Kishy Shev, Luke Young. They're, they're just defenders. They're just back four and a goalie, for example. So you forge a relationship with them. And then, you know, Matt Holland, Scott Parker, Mark Kinsella, Klaus Jensen. What a player. Yeah, incredible. You know, Yule, Bartlett, Johansson, John Robinson, Graham Stewart. God, they, they, these are top, top players. But I don't think they make the top bracket throughout football. You know, yeah. so Everton, Everton will tell you their player and they're better than this. And, you know, 
Arsenal, Leicester, everyone's got their own group of this and the other. But that was a that was a very, very good team who were really low maintenance and who were they weren't just thrown together. You think I think at the time, God, how lucky is Curbs? But no, that's that's not fair. Um that that was a group molded and crafted and put together. Um with the outcome being these guys are one very good players, but two very good people, solid sort of solid citizens that get the job done, and and we did, you know, we did, and we did it over a long period of time. Amazing. So obviously we'll get into um, your coaching career a bit later on, but I'm interested from what you said there. When you're um, as a coach where you are now, and obviously you're talking to you're talking to Roy about recruitment. Is that something from your experience at Charlton and these type of clubs that you kind of bring to the forefront, um, whether it's the goalkeeping department or anywhere, that they've got to be the right character, they've got to be the right person to fit into, you know, Palace's vision at the moment? So it's really interesting. Uh, and I was, uh, I'm forever looking on previous things and, and sort of training logs and diaries and that that I keep. And um, we obviously met up with Ireland there um, uh, just in this last camp there now and um, talking to Keith Andrews, who's the assistant there. And my, my recruitment in terms of direct recruitment, as in that I have a, a part to play, uh, just for exa- example, at West Brom, Boas Mile was, we got from Hull and was the goalkeeper. When called upon, when Ben Foster was injured, was great and was and is literally still at the club now. Yeah, so there's a solid, solid, solid right. investment. <laughs> ben Foster, four million pound investment, um, and was there up until they got relegated not longer, way, way after I was there. So that's worked out right. And then thereafter, Stephen Reed. You ask him football about Stephen Reed, what a fella. Keith Andrews, Ben Watson, Shane Long, Liam Ridgewell, Craig Gardner. These are all people I either played with or socially knew or had a connection to and then put into the mix in terms of our recruitment. So I'll stand by them fellas in terms of do I one know a player? Yeah, I do. And do I two know a person? Because yeah. equally important is that person is... So the fella at West Brom, for example, who buys a season ticket and comes on a Saturday or a Tuesday night is seeing 90 minutes of football. Um, but, but the person you're buying to, be, to, to come and play in that team, you're with them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. Friday, sometimes Sunday, on a Saturday, on a Tuesday night. But you're spending a lot of time with them. If they're idiots or if they're egomaniacs, they're going to disrupt things. So you want the nucleus of your, your team to be solid stand-up fellas. And they're the, they're the ones I... Now, listen, solid stand-up fellas who aren't very good at football are not going to work out. They've got to be very good at football. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> but I think secondary to that or nearly as important as that is what they're like as, as people and what types are you getting. And I think in that list I'll give you, they're, they're solid, they're solid people, you know? Oh, hundred percent. And I, and I think it's, uh, it's a testament really like the list of players, you know, Ridgewell, Gardner that you mentioned are all still players now that, um, you know, being a massive West Brom supporter myself, are still, you know, talked about really fondly, like, like yourself, you know, within you go onto West Brom social media and, you know, when, when you've done something or, you know, when, when you hear about Craig Garner or Ridgewell, you know, West Brom fans are always still interested. And those type of players yeah. really do have a massive impact. And I think that says a lot about, obviously, your recruitment style to identify that and players that sort of warm to the fans quickly as well. Um, so, obviously, um, going back to um, your time at Charlton and the successes you had there, um, I'm really interested to uh, ask you about, um, obviously, when the time came to actually leave the club, um, obviously, how how was that for you? Because I know you went to uh, Portsmouth um, and obviously Luton Town for a while after that. Like, how was that leaving your home, um, you know, for all that time? Um, yeah, it was, um, I, I'll be honest, it was quite messy. Um, mm-hmm. So what so what happened really is, um, I've, I don't know if you can see, but I fractured, dislocated my finger, so I can't really bend it and whatever. So yeah. this one... This one came out, dislocated, went up and over the bone and fractured as well. 
Ouch. I had it sort of pinned and uh, and whatever. But um, the message, and which you all you hear retrospectively, the message into Curves was: Listen, he's he's done. This is gonna this is gonna do him. He he won't play, sort of thing. Um, so for me to be at that club for six years, and then that to happen, and then I was saying, no, no, listen, you know, the physio. Mickey Cole, who was my goalkeeping coach, also and also a physio, was saying, "Look, listen, no, this is fine. This is three months. This is three months. It's a bad injury, but three months. But you come back from it, no problem at all." So I, I felt it was deemed as a okay. So this could be an excuse to move it on. You know, he's been here six years, yet yeah, done great. This that, and the other, but maybe naturally we could move it on. And I felt it was probably probably used as a bit of leverage to negatively say, "Well, you know, he's." His fingers falling off, and he's he's done. Um, so it didn't sit well. It, I'll be honest with you, it didn't sit well with me. I didn't, I didn't like the way it was done. I didn't like the feeling surrounding it. And in all honesty, I'd signed at Charlton. I think I signed like four, four five year contracts. So I signed a five year contract, got promoted, ripped it up, signed another five year. First year in the Premier League, ripped it up, signed another one. They sent me the so. I think I had sort of two, three years left on my contract. Now, if I was a sort of mercenary type fella, I could, I could have literally, and I've seen it, I've seen it happen a hundred times in football where the player goes from his status changes in the group from yeah. playing to not playing. And he goes, well, listen, I've got three years left. So what are they going to do? They have to pay me up or whatever. I'll just sit in. I'm not bothered. Um, it never really crossed my mind to be that. Once I knew that they didn't really want me or the status had sort of changed, um, oh, I was done. I was, I was, I would look for the next one. I look for the next one. Of course. Um, and I've got to say it was only, it was only Peter Varney, who was the chief executive, the sort of, uh, the main CEO fella, uh, at the time who I had a really good relationship with. He, for me, he salvaged, the, the bitter taste that I had, the, the, the way it was ending was really, really messy. He salvaged it really by the way he, he ended it. And he did it with a bit of class, um, you know, in terms of there was a few bits that by the letter of the law, they didn't have to pay me or honour me with certain bits. But sure. he sort of waved and said, no, listen, after what you've done and this, that, and that. So he he pulled it back a little bit, you know, in terms of the way I was feeling. Um, and yeah, so it could have ended really acrimoniously and, and, and bad, which would have been a shame. Um, but like I say, he salvaged it a little bit for me, you know. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So so obviously moving on from um, from Charlton, obviously it sounds like from what you said, um, obviously what we talked about earlier on with your sort of mentality that you want to be, you know, first choice, want to be first name on the team sheet. So obviously moving to Portsmouth and then um, and then Luton, like what was the what was the situation at, at the time and what was the conversations you had with uh, uh, with Portsmouth when um, yeah, before you made so, that move? So think about what I've just told you the last five minutes about Charlton mm -hmm. and then think of the polar opposite of a football club where they just literally had a collection of 32 players. Mm -hmm. and these players obviously all been brought together and then just weeded out, tossed aside, used as pieces of meat, really. So the sell to me for Portsmouth, Portsmouth were, I don't think they were rock bottom of the Premier League. I joined in the January, but they were certainly in the bottom three, I think. And it was they went on to for the, their great escape to avoid relegation, of which I played all the games. And um, their list, their list was Jersey Dudek, Matt Swartzer. I think it, I came in at maybe three or four. Mm -hmm. Jersey Dudek, no way did he want to go at Portsmouth. Matt Swartzer, no way did he want to go. Did I want to go? Was it a burning ambition uh, of mine to do that? Uh, no. But the situation I found myself in with Charlton, which I just explained to you, meant that they wanted someone to play and try and help them out of a really, really tough spot. And that was my way out of Charlton. Um, so I went. Um, 
it's since transpired retrospectively, you know, Harry Redknapp being Harry Redknapp said, oh, to Alan Kirbishley, don't tell him to come to the training ground because we train at a school. It's horrific. We'll meet him somewhere else. It's that neither. So I go and I find. Um, and then the next day you rock up at the training ground. It is a school. It's not brilliant. Um, and these, there's these 30 odd players who don't know if they're going to play on Saturday, don't know if they're even going to be in the squad, but a training, it's, it, it is what it is. So I'm thinking, okay, this isn't ideal, but look, if I play, then, you know, I'll, I can show people what I can do and I'm not finished. My finger's fine and I'm, I'm still ready to go. Um, so they signed me, Pedro Mendes, who mm -hmm. had an amazing impact at Portsmouth, signed from Tottenham, and Noe Paramo, who they signed from Tottenham also, and Sean Davis. Um, so we signed to the huge amount of people that are already there. And incredibly, incredibly, we went on an amazing run. Last 10 games, I don't know how many we won, but it was a load, and we managed to escape. And it was amazing. a great was a great escape, you know, in terms of in terms of that. So from that point of view, it worked out well and it was a good move. From a club point of view, you know, Harry Redknapp run it like a like a used car lot, you know, and you were just yeah. a commodity. And you were, yeah, you're playing this week and no, you're not, whatever. So he's a fantastic man manager because he made me feel like 10 foot tall. Yeah. Every week in that January to May, the great escape. Hey, listen, Dino, well, oh, well played the weekend. Get around this one. Hey, get him going. I need him for the weekend. And, it, and you felt really connected. The minute we'd achieved survival and we stayed in the Premier League, I came back for pre-season and wow, the change was incredible. Right. So, for example, the best example I can give you is Joe Jordan, one of the coaches, for five months in the Great Escape, called me Dean, Dino, you know, was really warm because he wanted to get a tune out of us, you know, to yeah, yeah. maintain that thing. Thereafter, David James come in, a load of other players come in, my status changed a little bit, and Joe Jordan started calling me Keeper, which is my position, it's not my name. Yeah, it's yeah. My position. So it was quite cold, and it was quite... You, do, you did really feel like a commodity that was just being traded. Um, so that, so if I look at my Portsmouth time, I was there a year, six months, fantastic, six mm. months appalling. And what, what I knew, oh, sorry, working through that, so pre-season to maybe October, I'm just sat in on the bench, uh, not happy being on the bench, but it is what it is. Then really looking for a way, a way out, really. So I put a few feelers out and um, West Brom uh, intimated that they'd like to maybe take me in the January. Um, so what I thought was I needed to play some games, um, yep. get back up to speed, get into a rhythm. And that was the Luton loan. I went to Luton and played 11 or 12 games in a couple of months, November, December. Um, and it served a purpose. It was it was good for me. You know, it, it was okay. Club was good. People were people were nice, friendly, and it gave me a platform just to get back into sync of playing every week, which gave me my move to West Brom. Brilliant. So obviously, with that time at Portsmouth and Luton, which obviously sounds like you know it was difficult. There were lots of ups and downs, lots of changes, lots to deal with. Uh, did you were you sort of um, looking for a club like West Brom that you could almost call? almost call home like you did Charlton like you you know you felt a real valued member of you know their setup yeah I think um I think that for me like if you know if you want to be really really romantic about it and I was a little bit to a point is it's where I was a schoolboy you know my course, parents yeah, yeah. In, parents still lived in the Midlands it would mean it sort of felt like a full circle sort of move um I think Russell Holt had had a few, a few issues. I think Zuba Bula hadn't um, probably performed up to the level that was maybe thought of. And so it was an opportunity for me to go there. So um, again, really, the theme for me is I've always only ever gone where people want me to play and make a contribution. And Tony Mowbray said, 
you know, want you to want you to come in and I want you to play and want you, want, I want to try and help us get back to you know get into the Premier League. Um, so it was really really easy easy for me getting away um, you know from from the situation I was in to going to somewhere that wanted me to play. And really, like, listen, I think if you speak to people now, people will say, and I've said myself, Golden Era, Charlton, six and a half years I was there, but I was at West Brom for eight years as a player and a coach, but the time I was there was eight years. So um, it's a club that's that's played a big part in, in me as a player and as a coach and a, a club I look at really, really fondly. There's, there's no question. Amazing. So, uh, so your so your time as a player and um, how how was it working under? Um, obviously you mentioned Tony Mowbray. How how was it working under him, and how did you find that and his vision? Um, yeah, as as a player, obviously coming from a bit of a bit of a turbulent time um, in your career. Yeah, I mean, what it gave me was stability. It gave yeah. me um, being back in 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 a in a squad in a group that was settled that was very good and also um there were good people to be around and play with um so yeah i felt i felt at home pretty much straight away tony mowbray's way of playing certainly in the championship was a breath of fresh air you know the way he played this open expansive style and took it to the opposition and you know we were involved in some some really exciting i'd imagine if you had a season ticket and, you know, watching a Tony Mowbray West Brom side, you're getting value for money. It was, it was, it was really, really good. Um, and to again be invited into that um, was good for me. Um, we obviously just fell short that first, that half a season I was in, um, just fell short, and um, we made the playoffs, and then obviously got beat by Derby in the playoff final, which was a sort of tremendous um, disappointment. Um, because I think we were, I think we were worthy of going up the, what, what we'd done, but we just, uh, we just fell short, you know. Yeah, I, I remember it well. It was, uh, it was difficult because, like you say, you know, we were. I really thought that was going to be our year, um, but I, I guess that's it. I guess that's football. Um, you know, there have been many times following West Brom, and I'm sure you've experienced as well where things just don't, don't work out. Do they just kind of, kind of straight away? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so Ozzy, from your time at uh, West Brom, um, who were, I guess, the main characters and the main people there for you um, as players, uh, goalkeepers, coaches, uh, who you remember and really sort of stick out? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I'm indebted to Joe Corrigan because Joe Corrigan was the goalkeeping coach who identified that he wanted me to come in. <clears throat> so that was, that was great for me that someone who, who trusted you and believed in you, that was great. And actually gave me the coaching opportunity because by Joe Corrigan retiring um, and, you know, and saying he was going to retire, um, he said to me one day in one paragraph, listen, Dean, just letting you know, this is my last year. I'll be retiring at the end of the season. And just to let you know, I've told West Brom, don't advertise the job, give it to you. Um, which was unbelievable, you know, because, you know, if you're not very good or not a very nice person, you don't get asked to do those things. No, of course. You, you do those things if you're one competent at your job and two, you know, good with people and around people and you fit into the environment. So it was a huge, it was a huge compliment to me um, to do that. Um, it's sort of, you know, like from the, the disappointment of the, of the playoffs, the following year, we got um, promoted, and then we uh, then we in the, in the Premier League. Um, but the promotion for me was a little bit bittersweet because fantastic year we finished, you know, in the in the automatic places to go up. Um, but I sort of knew in the back of my head that I'd probably be replaced, um, and obviously Scott Carson came in. Um, so I would have it would have been fantastic for me to remain the goalkeeper in the Premier League and try and keep the team in the division. Um, but it didn't, it, 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 it obviously, oh, I think I was about 37, 38, maybe. So I get the, the long-term picture um, mm -hmm. is we need a, 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 you know, sort of younger goalkeeper. So the promotion for me to play, I think I played 44 games of the 46. I broke my toe and missed maybe two games. Um, so, 
brilliant achievement to get promoted, but then a right, you know, a right kick in the stomach to then go, well, thanks for everything, but, you know, you'll be the number two now sort of thing. So, which I really hadn't been in my career at all, really. Um, but, you know, my wife tells me all the time, you know, all these things happen for a reason. Like I say, sat on a bench in the Premier League behind Scott Carson, um, who I have to say I speak to today. He's oh, amazing. Good. We had a we had a great relationship. Um, and there was no animosity between me and Scott. I, I instantly clicked with Scott and found him to be a, a real great lad and we had a we had a good time. And in fairness, um that season in the Premier League, I played the last three games, and I, I think with about 12 or 13 games to go, I remember going to Tony Mowbray and saying, Look, listen. I'm, I'm ready to go, you know, I, I want to make a contribution. And he was like, yeah, I'm thinking about it. I'm sort of on the cusp of, I don't know, I'm not too sure, leave it with me. But he decided not to. And I played the last three, but the, the writing was already on the wall. We were, we were sort of pretty much done. Um, and then that's when I was afforded the opportunity, you know, Tony Moby was going to stay in and then went to Celtic, but had already said he was more than happy for me to be the uh, player coach. So, um, Di Matteo inherited me as a player stroke coach, really. Amazing. So, um, obviously, with the um, with your transition to coaching at West Brom, was this something that, um, obviously, as you um, you know gained an experience throughout your career, was this something that you thought I want to go into coaching, or was it that opportunity was sort of like thrust upon you and you thought, oh wow, this would be so good. Let's let's see where it goes. And obviously, it's led to uh, where you are today. Yeah, it, it, it has. There's no question, and it's um, it's worked out fantastically well. Because here, here I am, a decade later. Um, you know, I think I had a playing contract at West Brom until I was just over 41, which was, again, incredible. But the coaching element really landed in my lap. You know, I didn't think from an early age or in my 30s, yeah, I'm going to be a coach. You know, that's what I want to do. It's all I want to do. I'm going to strive to be that. It was only when it was fell into my lap with Joe moving on that I thought, well, do you know what? And, and actually, probably what Tony Mowbray said, and, and listen, he probably, it's amazing what what you retain and what I take from my career is like snippets off people. And probably if you ask them, they, they probably wouldn't remember. They're not memorable moments. But he said to me about doing the coaching when Joe Corrigan mentioned it, um, and I said, well, I don't know, Gaffer, what do, you, what do you think? You know, and he went, look, he said, what you don't realise is you're coaching every day. And yeah. I went, what do you mean? And he went, as an experienced player, the stuff you're saying to younger players and to members of the squad and what the, the knowledge you're imparting and the help you're giving them is that's coaching. And I was like, oh. And I didn't see it that way. And I went away out there and I thought, do you know what? Sort of what you're saying makes makes sense. Um, and I thought, well, why not? You know, and it was a it was a club. Now, listen, you know, if I'd have been offered player coach at Portsmouth, you'd be thinking, God, I'm writing it. This is a soap opera. Every day is a soap yeah, opera. Yeah. I'm not sure I want to be in this environment. But West Brom was a calm, solid, you know, regardless of, the ups and the downs and the boing boing type thing. It was, a well, it was a well run, solid football club with good people. So to be offered and afforded the, the role of coach, player coach and then coach, yeah, sat, sat well with me really. And do you think as well at the time, obviously, you know, we had some amazingly sort of, you know, technically gifted players in that team. But what you said, uh, linking back to Charlton almost, do you think it was the fact that the successful promotions, um, obviously we had that good run in the FA Cup as well um, while you were at the club, uh, FA yeah. Cup semi-final at Wembley. I was there for that game. Yeah. Um, do you think it was partly down to the mentality of the club at the time and the type of personnel that had been recruited? Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly it. I think um, it's no coincidence that the best times in my career and the clubs that I've been at were, again, you know, underdog teams, but underdog teams, but being successful, they're full of a certain type of people. And what it means is you can't just rely on your ability alone because with the greatest respect, you know, York, Berry in their respective divisions and Charlton and West Brom in their respective divisions, cannot go and buy 
world superstars to come in and just fix a problem. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. spend... We'll spend fifty million pound on a player who'll come in and score twenty five goals, or we'll buy the world's best goalkeeper who's going to keep loads of clean sheets, and we'll be sound. Yeah. So you never have that luxury. So you have to have different ingredients. And the main thing for me is, you know, when I look at my time at Charlton, West Brom, York, Berry, um, good players, good people, and you know, you go out on nights out, you socialise together, you go out for meals with you know, couples and wives and girlfriends and whatever. And you're like-minded people. You get on yeah. fantastically well because you're cut from the same cloth. You're, you know, forget the football for a minute, forget the ability. You're just solid people just trying to make a living and trying to work hard and knowing that if you work hard and come together and, 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 and form this team and this bond, that good things may happen. And, on the back of good things happening, you know, I, I, I don't make, I don't want to make it about money, but what I mean is, you know, you get new contracts, you get into the Premier League, you of course, get of course. status, you bet, you get more people talking about you because you're a bet on a better platform or a better um, footing. So, we, the best places are when everyone benefits from being successful, and everyone looks around at everyone in a dressing room or wherever it be and thinks. I like these fellas. These are, we've got a real good chance. And like I say, in the main, York, Berry, um, Charlton, and West Brom, give me, give me that feeling. No, no question. Amazing, amazing. So obviously, um, you know, it's been amazing to hear about your club career and your um, progression over time. But I'm also interested to talk about um, your time as an international. Um, obviously, with the Republic of Ireland, and what was that feeling? Because obviously, you made your debut in '99 against Turkey. Um, how was that? How was that experience? Was it how and how did it differ um, from obviously being a club goalkeeper? Yeah, I think um, obviously I was at Berry at the time, uh, and I'd had a couple of call ups and whatever, and it was amazing just to be even recognised and, and and that recognition of getting an international call up. So that was huge. Um, all my all my dad's family are, are in Ireland, so um, signing for a club is more an individual thing for you and your family you know your wife and your children is that that's your adventure the international um call-ups and caps and that they have further reaching sort of ripples in the fact that you know all my all my family in ireland were then immensely proud that you know that i, I was involved in this that and the other so it, it had it felt the weight and the gravity of it felt a bit bigger because you, you know you're representing representing a nation and all your relatives and you know are so they're buzzing that you're that you've been recognised by this and this that and the other and being called up. But then, when, in fairness, when you're in and around it, um, I've got to say, um, I got eleven caps over a, a long period. And listen, Shay Given, a room with Shay, he's an amazing goalie, top fella. I really like Shay; he's a good guy. Um, I could have had a, I could have had a few more caps. And it's amazing that you go beyond that initial recognition and the buzz that it gives you. Then it becomes, you know, I'm at Charlton, and hold on, I'm a, I'm a Premier League goalkeeper. Um, yeah, yeah. Shay Given's a Premier League goalkeeper, and so we're on an equal footing, you know, I'm so, and I show up well and flying around in training, doing my thing. So the 11 caps are, I'm immensely proud of. I think they're amazing. You know, I've got, I'm sat in the room and a couple of Ireland shirts around me and this, that, and the other there. It's a big deal going to a World Cup. Amazing, amazing, amazing um, achievement. But it gets to a level as in, but though there is, this is professional. This is my job. Yeah. So, it got to a stage where it's probably not producing the outcome I'm, I'm after. And it might be to the detriment of me playing for Charlton, West Brom, whatever it be. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to think about it a little bit. So I came away from it the one time, but like I say, as a 50 year old man now sat around, you get picked. And like I say, I'm involved in the coaching setup now. You get picked to represent your national team by what you do week in week out for your club side so 
that's a positive thing, you know. It, of course. It, it, the whole thing for me, Rob, through this whole thing is if you're good at what you do and you're good with people and you get along with people and you muck in and you help out and you make a good contribution, it's amazing that people want you around. Of course. They want you to help their club or their team or whatever it be. So it's really simple formula for me is that whoever wants you to do, you know, to come and work at their club or represent Ireland as, as my, my sort of nation, um, it's because you've been perceived as positive in what you do, you know, good at your job, a good person. And so that's the, that's the payoff for me, really. Amazing, amazing. So um, obviously throughout your career and the successes you've had, you've obviously played against a wide variety of players. Um, but I'm really interested, if you can't narrow it down to one, maybe a few names that kind of spring to mind. Obviously at international level, as we've talked about, um, you know, what an amazing honour, uh, you know, representing your country and then obviously at Premier League level as well. Um, but I'm interested to see um, who would be a uh, like standout striker who you played against or attacking midfield player who you played against and you were kind of, um, what's the best way to describe it? Sort of like, like, wow, like this, this, this is, this is proper opposition. You, you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do. And listen, it's an easy answer. I was talking about it the other day is that football is so instant is that it's all about now. So now yeah. sat here, you know, we're talking about, you know, Salah, um, you know, all these players and Aubameyang and this, that and the other. And it's almost like, well, football before was, well, I don't know, it's, it's way back when, it's black and white, it's in the distant thing. <laughs> it's, really, it's really, really funny in the fact that, you know, I was talking and we were talking, um, we were talking to some friends and this, that and the other. And I go, well, hold on a minute. Like, I played... Um, I played against, I played with Roy Keane, I played with Robbie Keane, I played against Robbie Keane, um, I played against Thierry Henry, Ruud van Nistelrooy, David Beckham, wow. Didier Drogba. So, hold on a minute, let's just get a handle on this, right? Yeah. The Premier League has been going for a long, long time. And in all that time, it's the elite top, top division. So it's always going to have attracted top, top players. Now, Football's about opinions, right? And I get, I get that. I would have a little... My caveat to that is some fella that's never been involved having an opinion on Twitter, his opinion is not as valid as, you know, my, for me to play the amount of games I've played at the level I've played, and this, that, and the other, is if your opinion of me is, oh, Dean Kyle is rubbish, I'm not sure that opinion counts. So my point of course, is... Of course, of course. played it at the top level against top, top, top players, you know? So that's all right. So I'm sat here now totally comfortable with my career, totally comfortable with the choice I've made. And they're, they're top, top players. My son says to me, if ever want to see you on a telly, Dad, now, I just watched Thierry Henry's that Premier League 100 thing. Oh, yeah. Scored, Greatest moments. Yeah, yeah. He scored like 14 goals past me. And... I don't deem that as a, you know, I was having a bit of a pop for this and the other. It's like, that's good. You watch Thierry Henry score goals past me because you know why? I was playing in the Premier League. Exactly. So that's all right. That's fine. That's no problem. <laughs> yeah. So, these, these, so when you say, can you narrow it down? Actually, I could expand it out to Janino, whatever. You know, I could reel off loads. And it'd probably make people of our, you know, not yours, probably your era watching, but people of my era go, wow, yeah. Oh, do you remember him? And oh, what yeah, a yeah. He was. Do you know what I mean? So I don't like, like I say, I'm happy that the people deem the Premier League as it is the best now, as in today. Yeah. But I'm telling you, the Premier League has been the best throughout. It's oh. always been the Premier League. So you know, and I've been I've been exposed to that, which means I've been exposed to playing with and against the best players which which is amazing you know oh yeah 100 percent. and like and some of the names um that that was sort of the era where i was i was getting to an age where i was starting to you know understand football as a fan and you know start to register it and you know i've got great memories just watching the games at home on the telly 
and obviously going to going to West Brom with my dad and seeing these kind of players. So yeah, yeah. The, the the experience you've experiences you've had, you know, playing against these top players must be really helpful for your coaching as well. Um, you know, being able to pass on to these younger goalkeepers, uh, you know, coming up through the ranks of you know how you know the level you've got to be at to obviously compete against these top class strikers. Yeah, and I think it's about um, I think it's about longevity. I think if you look at um, you know the Premier League or the Championship or whatever it be, really, is that you know keepers maybe burst on, they have a little flurry, and then they fall away. You know, so you I'm, I'm all about being sustainable and being con- for me is for a goalkeeper to play at whatever level is consistent, reliable, dependable. Now those words will not. They will not rank in the the sort of those words that take your breath away, but to be consistent, reliable, dependable at a high level, at yeah. an elite level. But if you can be those things, you've got a chance. You've got a hell of a you've got a hell of a chance because anybody can anybody can put in a unbelievable performance now and again, or take yeah. a man of the match award now and again. But if you're not backing it up with consistency then those peaks and troughs are too big and you will fall away because managers want certainty of performance, like performance levels. So that's, that, that's where I'm at really in terms of what I'm looking, looking for. Amazing, amazing. So obviously, um, to think looking back on your career, we've talked about different managers you've worked under, but would you say uh, you have a favourite? Um, a guy that's sort of, a man that sort of sticks out and you think like, wow, you know, this was, whether it was your relationship or the times you had, uh, was there anybody that really sort of stuck out for you? I think, listen, it, I don't know, you might, you might look at me now down Zoom and go, oh, right, okay. But like Roy Hudson is my current manager, but I worked with him at West Brom before. And what I would say is what I've learned from him, I mean, Roy's been doing it for 43 years. Yeah, what a career. Top level. So when he speaks and when he tells you things about different things, uh, about different areas and facets of football, you sort of listen because he's not faddy. He's not talking in today's speech, you know, speak in terms of all these buzzwords. He's just telling you about football. And so for me, when I look at all my journals and all my diaries, the most the most extracts or the most um, stuff I've got in there are from, are from Roy, you know? So um, I would have to say to be in and around uh, and be in an inner circle of which Roy Hudson is the manager of which I was at West Brom and now at Crystal Palace is, is big for me. But what I would say is um, you take, I think now I mold and I shape everything on all my experiences. So, John Bird was my first manager at York City. And you take little things or you remember little things or, or the ways he did things or things he said or what he wanted. You know, John Ward, Alan Kerbishley, Neil Warnock, Stan Turnan, Tony Mowbray. There's, there's loads that have mould and shaped me, but, you know, all just little, little ingredients that bring me to Dean Kiley at 50 as a coach. Cool. My, my beliefs, the way I want football played or what I want to see or the traits I want in players that I'm working with are all moulded and shaped by that really but probably the overriding one I think would be would be Roy by by, by a mile. Amazing so obviously um, perfect time to start talking about um, obviously your coaching career um, obviously working with uh, Crystal Palace and uh, obviously more recently the Republic of Ireland as well uh, congratulations on that and what amazing uh, achievement how, how are you finding sort of um, balancing both uh, both yeah. responsibilities obviously I understand time wise obviously you go to the camps while it's not on but obviously I guess you've got your uh, you know you're overseeing the development of quite a lot of you know high level uh, goalkeepers yeah no it's um, I mean for me is it, it's funny I was talking to my wife and we were saying that I've never applied for a job you know as yeah. a player you, you they, they come to you you don't apply for anything but as a coach Obviously, things are advertised and this, that, and the other. But Joe Corrigan and Tony Mowbray offered me the West Brom job. Mm-hmm. Um, Tony Pulis got rid of me. Then 
I go to Norwich. I got approached to go to Norwich. I got approached to go to Preston. I got approached off Royd to go to Crystal Palace. So Stephen Kenny approached me. I didn't apply for anything to, to be the Republic of Ireland goalkeeping coach. Um, there is a time, you know, like you said, you know, it does take your time, but it's something that it's, it, it's an amazing thing to be involved in because um, I'm at this moment in time, a Premier League goalkeeping coach. I love the work. I love the day-to-day, the week-to-week stuff of how you're trying to put things together. Um, the international thing I found as a player, it's got a different rhythm to it. It's certainly got that. And then so as a goalkeeper, as an international goalkeeping coach, it does work on a different rhythm, but it's stimulating for me because I work with different people that I haven't come across. I work with different group. I work with different group of goalkeepers. Um, so I deem that as a as a positive. You know, I want to I want to work with. I want to try and affect to try trying to help as many goalkeepers or managers, coaches as I can. You know, and certainly the ones you want to um, help and do well for and add some value to are the ones that have invited you to do that job. And yeah. I really take it, I really just take it really, really personal. Is Roy Hodgson rings me up and says, do you want to come and work with me at Crystal Palace? I say, yeah, I've got, yeah, definitely. And then I go and I want to make his job as easy as possible with the work I'm doing with the goalkeepers. And it works the same. Stephen Kenny, you know, asked me, did I, would I like to be involved? Yeah, I would, Stephen. I want to come and I want to be your goalkeeping coach and I want to help you be successful. And for whatever you want to create, I want to be part of it. So it's, it's, it's good. I enjoyed it. You know, I mean, obviously, this last trip, the results weren't, uh, weren't fantastic, but the environment, uh, the, the process, the people I were working with was, was excellent. And the three young goalkeepers in Matt Travers, Gavin Bazuna, and uh, Kieran O'Hara. We're a breath of fresh air. It, it, it was great to work with. I, I came back um, disappointed with the results, but absolutely, I was buzzing with the uh, with, with the um, uh, you, you know how it how it went for, for me personally. I, I had a great I had a great time. Amazing, amazing. So obviously, um, you talked about um, obviously the results um, from your from the previous camp, and that that's got me really interested in. Um, obviously, from an outsider, from a supporter's perspective, I, I understand being a goalkeeper must be well the most difficult role on the pitch. And as as far as obviously your training, um, obviously you've got to have the physical attributes to be able to do it, and the training and the know how. But how do you prepare your players for the psychological? Um, I guess strength that it takes being that role on the pitch where you know you, you you make those saves and you're a hero if you make that mistake or not you know you can be the villain sort of almost straight away so how, how have you used your experiences to uh, pass that on to your players at yeah the moment? I think um, I think the, the way I look at it is as a player I played my best football when I was in a comfortable environment and by comfortable, I don't mean soft and easy. Or I mean comfortable as in you just feel everything's right for you just to go and perform. And yes. the people you're working with are positive, so the coaches are positive, and they want to help. So the way I the way I set out to do it is um, I say to all the goalkeepers, whether they're old, young, or in bet- anywhere in between, is I set the tone. Well, I set the environment. I set the tone. You know, I have to be enthusiastic about what I'm doing. Um, I'm not a commanding coach. I think commanding coaches are, are gone. They, they, I don't, if they do exist, I don't think they're successful. So the commanding coach that says, this is how you must do it. This is what you must do and you know, why you must do it. They're, they're gone. And I've never been that. I've never, ever been that coach. So I've never once said to a player retrospectively, you should have done this, you should have done that, that's yeah. what you should have done. Because it's so easy and it's so soft to do that. Um, I want to inform my goal. So we're playing Everton the weekend. Mm-hmm. So the preparation into Everton for me is how do they score their goals? Who are their threats? What do they look like attacking-wise? Where, you know, where do they score their goals from? Right. My goal, my 
training, my coaching has got to look realistic to that, to a point. Um, the other stuff that takes up the time is ingraining technique, ingraining yeah. all those movements that goalkeepers need. And actually, you know, I can do stuff undercover where goalkeepers don't know what they're working on sometimes, you know, um, but I do and I see what they do and I just have a little smile to myself and think, that's it. They're the movements. That's the footwork. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Need. That's the footwork you need to, to do, but I don't need to stop the session and go, Hey, amazing. Did you see how you did this really well? They're just automatically doing it. And it's because of what you've set up and what you've, what you've put on as a, as a drill. So that married to the fact that then you work into the realism of what Everton bring, where they score the goals from and yeah. what I replicate, I, I duplicate that. And then really is on a match day. It's funny, you know, um, when I was, I was at Preston for four or five months and Chris Maxwell was the goalkeeper and Declan Rudd was the, uh, was there as well. I had Declan previously at Norwich, but Chris Maxwell's, um, we would warm up on, on a match day, quarter past two, whatever it be, 10 past two. And when I left, you know, a remark was made, just for example, and it's a throwaway thing as in, oh, well, Dean Kiley's left to go to Crystal Palace. Oh, good, good riddance because his warm-ups were rubbish, right? Right. So, but the point is, it's not my warm-up. It's Chris yeah. Maxwell's warm-up. Right. So what, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeing, so what you're seeing, what you'll see on Monday night is Vicente Guaita's warm-up. Because... Who cares what my warm up looks like or what I think is the best warm up? It's down to the player because he needs to feel comfortable. He needs to feel empowered in that he's involved in the process for him to perform. So he sets the tone. Now, if he said to me, my warm up is I sit at the foot of the post for 20 minutes, I'd have to intervene and say, listen, we need to, <laughs> we need to touch all these bases that, yeah, that yeah, yeah. come your way. But my point is, my point is, I'm not a commanding coach. You have to empower the goalkeeper to be yeah. part of the process for him to get himself into the place, the best place for him to perform. And I think, listen, half time, end of the game, um, all I need to do is just be that positive reinforcement for him. If things are going well, then just reinforce that. If he's made a mistake, Let's park it, leave it away. The next thing that happens cannot be a result of you making a mistake. It's clean. We move on to the next thing. That's how we work. And, this, and, that, and that positive reinforcement. And at the end of the game, a win, a defeat, whatever. How have you played? How have you performed? How did you feel? All those things. We review them. We, we revisit them. But it's not about picking negative scabs off things and, 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 no, and of me look at what you should have done and why did you do that? That's one, it's not me as a person, it wasn't me as a player and it's a million miles away from me as a coach. It's all about, it's all about the, 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 the goalkeeper really is the fact. So I have a wry smile when, you know, people, oh God, that warm-up was this or this, that and the other. And I think, well, I could answer that question directly with, well, it wasn't my warm-up. It was yeah. the goalkeeper's yeah. warm-up. But, there's no mileage, there's no value in, in, in getting involved in stuff like that. But it does make me smile, secretly smile. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's a billion mile, miles away from uh, the process and how we work. Amazing, amazing. So obviously, um, you've talked a lot about um, your your sort of like individual approach to uh, working with each goalkeeper and empowering them, and that sounds it. I mean, do you think uh, that's that sort of um, your position as a uh, as a goalkeeper? Do you think that's how it um, how it changes from uh, like working with the first team sort of as a unit? Do you think is is uh -huh. like as like the outfield players? Would it be sort of controlling them as a group, and then obviously the goalkeepers? It's very much an individual plan for them uh, yeah, to so, work towards their personal goals. Yeah, so probably I mean I have a small group. Yeah, so I have three senior goalkeepers. There might be an opportunity to have a couple of younger ones to come to that. But if you work on the assumption that I'm working with three senior goalkeepers, 
mm-hmm. I have to affect them. Um, one's going to play, one's going to be sat on the bench, and one's not even going to be in that squad. So uh, their expectations have to be managed by me. Their reactions to their position have to be managed by me, um, whether that's good, bad or indifferent. Um, I don't mind doing that at all. Um, I have an input with the, with the outfield players as well, because obviously the goalkeeper works in part as a defensive unit. And sometimes that defensive unit is the back four and, uh, you know, if there's two sitting midfielders. Um, so I want to impart stuff to them also. Um, I do the set plays at Crystal Palace for and against. So um, the manager is more than happy for me to be um, involved in that process and me to drive that process. So I'm certainly not the goalie who's the goalie coach who's just in the corner of the field kicking balls at three goalies. I have I have other um, duties and stuff that um, I'm involved in, which I enjoy, which I enjoy doing. Um, so, like I say, I'm sat here talking to you now. I'm happy um, with the position I'm in. I'm happy with the roles and the responsibilities I have. I think I carry them out. Um, well to the best of my ability and I give of my best you know I, I sort of um I sort of work I work hard and and I like I say I think a I think a symptom or a product of what I've tried to do is it, I just always try and prove people right if you want me to be your goalie I'll come and prove you right that yep. I was the right person to pick if you want me to be your goalie coach if you've asked me to be your goalkeeping coach I'm just going to rock up and give of my best and try and try and do do what I can to make it to make it work and add some value to what you're trying to do amazing amazing so um, obviously from your experiences um, I'm really interested to find out what um, the direct advice maybe there's people listening to this who are um, aspiring coaches um, aspiring goalkeepers what advice would you give to people who are you know starting out in the game like I mean obviously from personal experience I'm I'm very much at grassroots level at the moment I love it and I really enjoy it but what would you say to people who are looking to sort of climb the ladder that you've um, obviously so successfully done uh, in your career? So I think um, a coach I worked with at West Brom a while ago, um, it, it, flippantly a throwaway remark, and, and it, it's more a humorous remark, is, you know, he said, like, a good coach is a good thief. Meaning <laughs> yeah. what, what you do is you pick off people when you learn and you, you take from different sessions you see. What I, what I would say with that, I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a sort of comedy sort of throwaway line, but actually it's got loads of truth attached to it. It mm. really, really is. But what I would say is that the, the good coaches and the people, what they identify is they don't take something or run with something and just put somebody else's session on sort of parrot fashion, how they've seen it. The yeah. good one, what they do is they see something and they think, how can that work with the group I'm with or the environment I'm in? I might need to tweak it. What if you added this or if you took that away and replaced it with that? Would it work? And, you know, for me, a lot of my best work was being a player coach, sat on the bench behind Scott Carson mm. and me, Scott Carson and Luke Daniels going, me putting sessions on. And then after the actual official session has finished, Scott going, Dean, you know that thing you did with the coloured, like the coloured, different coloured discs? Do you think if, should we try and do it this way? And do you think it'd be better if we did that? And I go, instead of going, no, 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 that's my session, I've done it, and this is how it yeah, is. Yeah. And no, 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 no. I go, yeah, let's, let's try it. And then we'd try something and he'd go, I think that's, I think that's a bit better. And I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think that works. And you take that and you absorb it in. Or you go, and I say to the, I say to the goal, all the goalies I work with, listen, I have no ego. It isn't the gospel of goalkeeping according to Dean Kiley. I'll serve what I think is realistic and what works. And you you will take, it will, it will stick to you or you'll discard it as you see fit. But don't sure. think I have an ego. So you tell me what's good, bad or indifferent. But what I mean is about good coaches, good coaches take an idea, they run with it, they add things to it, they take things away from it and they're forever evolving it. 
And I think some of my sessions now in 2021 look really different to sessions I did in 2011. Mm. And it might be the same theme and it might be on the same type of thing, but they'll have evolved and they look different now. And I think that's right. If they still look in 2021 the same as they looked in 2011, I'm doing it wrong. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. So as obviously um, talking about, um, you know, the evolution of, of your coaching and, and the game itself, um, obviously we've talked, we've talked about, um, you know, the sort of the on the field input that you have with your goalkeepers. Um, it's something that we spoke a bit earlier on in the podcast, um, obviously in regards to social media. I'm really interested, um, you know, in the fact of how much do you talk to your players about that with uh, social media? Because I understand, you know, obviously, um, you know, as a professional footballer, it can be a very unforgiving place. And, you know, I, some of the things I see, you know, you, you see online are just are terrible, really. You know, what, what's being said about goalkeepers and players. And, you know, I just wondered, you know, as obviously somebody with your experience in the game, what sort of advice do you, uh, do you give out to those younger players coming through? So straight away, straight away is there's, there's one saying, I, I live and die by and it is perception is not reality cool. so so there will be tonight I'd imagine if you search the right place in this that near that um, Crystal Palace and Crystal Palace right now will be talking about we've got 37 points there'll be some people say well we should have 47 points or there's some people say you're lucky to have 37 points and there'll be some people say give Roy Hodgson another year's contract. And there'll be some people saying, oh, get rid of Roy Hodgson. So every, every opinion is referenced and is visible. But my point is, that's, they're just perceptions. And oh, perceptions oh. are not reality. So if I work at Crystal Palace, which I do, the reality of that are the relationships I have with the manager, the coaches, the players, the director of football, the secretary, the kit man, this, that, and that. We're in that inner circle. We're living it. We're breathing it. So that's the reality. That's it. That's, that's where we're at. So the goalkeepers is, again, give you a hypothetical scenario. Um, Oh, the goalkeeper should have come for that cross. What's he doing? I oh, should have saved that. He should have this. He should have that. They're all opinions. You may class them as valid opinions, you know, as stakeholders in football. You know, I buy a season ticket, so it entitles me to opinion. Yes, yes, and yes. But no, your opinion is not reality. No, of course. That's it. That's it. So easy. Easy for me to the goalkeepers is I've ado- I work for Crystal Palace, you work for Crystal Palace. We're trying to help Crystal Palace win, okay, by performing and training to perform. Let's get you in the best position we can for you to perform. Then after your performance, let's review and let's discuss and let's debate and let's find the reasons why things were good, bad, indifferent. Now, in that process, I don't need to know what someone from Croydon thinks about yeah. the situation. Yeah, of course. It's as simple as that. There's a fella, there was, when I played for West Brom, I think I played 89 times for West Brom, which isn't a lot or whatever. But most of those times when the ball went behind for a goal kick, there was a fella a couple of rows back behind the goal who used to go, Sort it out, Kylie, whether we're winning or losing. Yeah. Right? So if I take that as his perception is the actual reality, then I need to sort... Yeah, you're right, mate. I need to sort this out. But that's just some fella sat in the stands. Yeah, and of course. Right, there, right then, that is his go-to fail-safe shout. I need to shout at someone, the goal is the nearest, I'll give it him. Right. That doesn't mean what he's shouting is correct. It just means it's his perception. And unfortunately for him, his perception isn't the reality of the situation. So I am not driven by social media. I'm not driven by 
um, a, you know, a bloke down the pub said, you know, Crystal Palace should have 50 points. Well, okay, that's your opinion, but it doesn't warrant being that that's not reality. So I just deal with reality. I don't email, I don't do many emails, I don't do many this, I don't do many that in terms of all that sort of stuff. Of what I think I major in is direct contact, face to face, talking to people. And that's normally the goalkeepers I'm coaching, the manager I'm working for, the coaches I'm working with, and the staff that I'm working with. It's a really small group. That's the only people that, that I'm bothered about. And next week, Rob, if someone pulls me in and says, listen, your time at Crystal Palace is done, you leave, then I don't directly talk to them people. I move on to the next thing and they become my direct, realistic reality. Simple. Brilliant. And I and imagine for, you know, especially the younger players that you've got, having, having somebody, you know, of your experience and that attitude, must be really, really refreshing and good for them, um, you know, because obviously, like, like you know, if you, this generation, like teenagers now, have kind of grown up with social media, like in, you know, in yeah. this age. So, so having your perspective on it must just be absolutely invaluable well, for them. Again, I hope so, because the position I'm coming from is one of, I'm trying to be positive. So, yeah, of course. social media is, if you win on a Saturday, right in front of that player's faces, you're amazing, you're brilliant, that was great, you're fantastic. Now, if you absorb that and believe it, then you're 10 foot tall. But if on a defeat or a mistake is, you're rubbish, you're crap, that was dreadful, you're appalling, you're this, you're that, that's the thing that you absorb. The, the trick and the knack is to not literally look what's right in front of your face and the in, that knee-jerk reaction to what you've done you need to look further mid and long distance in terms of you know that journey as in I've been selected for the team I've played my made my debut oh, I've now played 10 games oh I've now playing most of the season the manager plays me in this you know that's where you need to be looking and that's where you need to be heading not these little pitfalls that can pull you off of that pathway and and that is that is social that is social media unfortunately exactly. and i'm sure when all the people that developed these things years ago they didn't envisage it as being what it is now but unfortunately it, it, it is it is what it is and you've got to you've got to deal with it and it, it is a it is another another thing that modern day players have to deal with um which is for me it just seems a little bit unnecessary of course, yeah, no, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, from a personal perspective, obviously, on a lot smaller scale, I try and keep my uh, social media, um, obviously, with the with the podcast and my personal stuff, just as positive as possible, because I think there's also the other thing as well, you know, whether it's a football player, whoever it is, you never know what someone else is going through on the other side of that screen, do you? So, you know, it's better to use your words positively, kindly, and like what we've talked about, you know, creating these positive relationships with people, you know, I think that's personally a very... Um, you know, a very important thing. Yeah, agreed. So, um, so obviously with uh, your current uh, group of goalkeepers, I'm interested um, to kind of find out um, who, who at the moment, I guess, is really um, maybe like a younger prospect, um, who's, who's sort of exciting you as a moment as, as, as kind of a prodigy for the future or names that we should be looking out for. Um, obviously, you know, there are well-established goalkeepers like Wayne Hennessy, for example, at Palace, um, you know, who are well-known, but who's sort of coming through the ranks at the moment um, under your under your kind of watchful eye, um, who, you know, we should be looking out for as supporters? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, obviously, you know, Vicente Goy, uh, Jack Butland, Wayne Hennessy, Stephen oh. Henderson there. I mean, I said three that, you know, it's a, it was a mistake on my part. There's actually, there's, there's the four of them at the moment. Um, and they've, you know, good careers, good solid pros, elite players. Um, it was interesting, actually, um, while away um, with the Republic of Ireland, um, Darren Randolph and Cueve and Kelleher were both injured, which meant that uh, the goalkeepers I had with Ireland were Mark Travers, who's um, just in his early 20s at Bournemouth, Gavin Bazunu, who's 19, 
who made his senior debut, um, and Kieran O'Hara, who's another young goalkeeper at Burton Albion, who who was previously at Man United. And um, I came away uh, the 10 days, again, we spoke about the results not being fantastic, but in terms of them as goalkeepers and their ability levels was um, was excellent, you know. So I, I, I came away thinking um, that it was a privilege for me to work with... Um, Work with such uh, young, talented goalkeepers. That was um, that. That was my takeaway from from that trip. Really, amazing, amazing. So it's been so great to hear about um, your coaching career and obviously footballing career. Um, but I'm really interested uh, before we uh, kind of come to the end of the podcast. Um, what you like to do and sort of what makes you tick sort of outside of the world of football. Because obviously you've been involved. Um, you know, a long successful career in the game. Um, you know, what, what type of stuff do you like to do to sort of like take your mind off it and sort of put your feet up and chill out? So all, all the stuff that I like to do is currently unavailable. Like totally oh, of unavailable. Course. Yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm really, really simple. Um, I, like, I, like, I like to play golf. I don't play yeah. it often because literally I live in, at the moment, I live in Norwich and I work at Crystal Palace. So I'm either kicking balls at goalies or driving on a motorway. Literally, yeah, yeah. That, that is my life. Um, so I don't have much time to do that, but I enjoy golf. Um, I like horse racing. I, I sort of owned a couple of horse um, horses over the years. And that was, for me, really, as a player, it was a different environment where people are not wearing football tops at racing. You know, when I go racing, they're not talking about football. They have a real, not a great interest in football. So it was somewhere I could socially just get away and do something else. So I enjoy horse racing. And the rest of the time, it would be just me and my wife. You know, my kids are all grown up now. I see them, obviously, but me and my wife going just for something to eat or, you know, a bottle of wine and a meal. And again, but can't do, uh, can't do any of them things at the moment. But um, that's, that's, probably, that's probably me. Amazing, amazing. So I just want to say a massive thank you for your time this evening. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, I've been a big fan of yours, so it's been great to sit down and chat and uh, really hear about and thank you for being so open and honest uh, you know you've been an absolute great guest yeah well listen uh, anybody that gives me the opportunity to talk about myself for a bit um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know at all, so yeah. no, listen, I, listen I hope it you know listen I, I think everybody thinks that their journey and their pathway and this that and the other is amazing I'm not you know but I hope that there's some takeaway messages from that and, and and that people can take from it or learn from it or maybe apply I don't I don't know you know I don't think it's over complicated my career to date you know in terms of playing and coaching but you know hopefully there's something to take away from it it's it's pretty simple when, when I look at it no 100% so thanks again Dean for your time um I will leave uh links down to your Twitter uh down in the description if people want to go over there and follow you and keep up to date um keep up to date with what with your goings on with you um and yeah i just want to say massive best of luck for uh, the rest of the season with palace and obviously with your duties with republic of ireland as well it's been great to talk to you today thanks rob cheers mate